Chad Ruffin. I'm an ENT surgeon in Seattle, Washington. I have bilateral cochlear implants and I do a lot of disability advocacy and trying to help people really understand how to be successful with hearing loss. My name is Haley and I'm interested in becoming an ENT surgeon. I have a few questions to ask you. What kind of skills are required for your job? And how do you communicate when you have a difficult time hearing? Well, I wear cochlear implants, so I communicate with listening and spoken language. And thankfully I hear well enough to hear around masks that are required for COVID. In the operating room, I pretty much do the same thing. Uh, sometimes I will wear a, a microphone, uh, like an FM system, like just like a one-way microphone for uh, people that I'm observing uh, do surgery, meaning I'm not standing around the operating room field. But apart, when I'm actually scrubbed in and doing surgery, I use my ears like anyone else. The Through medical training and getting up to that point, it's really different because when you are a trainee, you are at the bottom of the totem pole, so to speak. So I, at learning to advocate for yourself and what you need is really difficult, I think. Once you're out and you're the person in charge, you really can shape the situation to what you need to. And I think that's really critical to work as hard as you can in your formative years because it gives you confidence when you're out and on your own to really advocate for yourself and set things up how you need them. The first surgeon to, the first person who was born deaf to become a surgeon was actually a, um, a woman named Dr. Uh, Erhart. I'm blanking on her first name. But she actually signed and used interpreters to uh, go through her training. I don't think she actually got a cochlear implant until later on. And I think that goes to show that, that it's not really about how you communicate. It's just that communication is happening. And can uh, other people are confident that it's happening. And they're not having to second guess you. Basically, this is a fluid process. So I think that... If you can express yourself uh, and also get the information, you pretty much will be good. Another question I have is, let me see here. Who is your biggest supporter and how do you find the courage to keep trying new things that are difficult to do. For most people, that's going to be your PI in a lab or an attending in residency or medical school that has given you good advice. I think that's a pretty limited definition of a mentor. I think true mentors are the ones who pull you up, meaning they identify talent and drive and they work to bring these people into the fold. And those are really the people that you want to look for. And one of those who was key for me was Dr. Marianne Couch, who was one of the uh, very few female academic chairs of a surgical department. In ENT, I think there were only two. And when, I, when she first came to Indiana, I remember thinking, uh, recalling that fact and realizing that she must have drive and dedication um, and probably thinks a little bit differently because she had to she had to figure out how to succeed in a very male dominated specialty that is very well known to be have quite a degree of sexism. So I think that to survive in that, you had to be very creative and not just to survive, but to advance. So I bonded with her right away and talking about the challenges that I had in getting into medicine. And I thought that was really key because when you are a minority in a very small minority, you want to 
find people who are going to pull you up. And the best way I think to do that is to find other minorities who are successful. And over my career, I tried to find mentors who are willing to help pull me up and help me succeed. And I invest in those relationships. Thank you. You're welcome. And where are you in your journey? Uh, journey in terms of your undergraduate, what are you studying? Right now, I am in my senior year of high school. Oh, wow. Wow, I did not realize that. Um, and where are you going to go to school for college? My plan is to go to a local college for two years and then transfer somewhere else. Have you um, looked at any organizations like Association of Medical Professionals with Hearing Loss? They have a very active Facebook group uh, and there's a lot of people in there with all kinds of communication backgrounds and uh, lots of doctors who um, are capital D deaf, who are oral and uh, sign, mostly use SIMCOM, I believe. Um, there's all kinds of communication backgrounds in that organization. So what got you interested in medicine? When I was a little kid, I went to the emergency room for a bad headache and the doctor there really inspired me. The doctor told me I could do anything I want in the future and that I will be successful in whatever I wanna do. Normal hearing people, thoughts just appear in their head, like, uh, and they're thinking about those thoughts abstractly. Uh, they're able to uh, think at a very high level, whereas hear people with uh, hearing loss have to think at that high level, jump back into the weeds, get the information, think at the high level, jump back into the weeds and get the information. They're constantly bouncing up and down in terms of being at the bird's eye view and b versus being in the weeds. And that is really, really cognitively tough to do. So for example, when I'm in the operating room as a trainee, I would be around the uh, table and I didn't really uh, have that much casual uh, conversation. I didn't make that many jokes or something because my brain was so intently focused on monitoring the room, making sure that everything was going on uh, okay. And also listening to my attending. So when I hear my attending talk, I have to um, figure out what they're saying, you know, individual words, put them together, make a sentence, and then think about, okay, are they teaching me a piece of anatomy? What's the 3D structure around that anatomy? What's underneath the structure? What's going to be over here, you know? So I had all of this stuff going on in my head, and I wasn't making much casual conversation. I wasn't joking. Um, I didn't have banter in the uh, operating room. So people thought that I was disinterested in surgery, that I just wasn't interested. I'm like, hello, <laughs> I, w I get up and I round at 5.30 in the morning on patients. I subject myself to some of the most difficult hearing environments uh, for a person with hearing loss. And of course I'm interested in doing this, but hearing people don't th think that way and you have to make it visible to them. You, your goal in, uh, with hearing loss is if you can't communicate as fluently as a normal hearing person in every situation, you need to make that visible to them so that they understand how to help you. And you have, you have to give them concrete, uh, concrete examples. And being able to quickly tell hearing people that it's hard for you to do that in certain situations, I think that was something that I didn't learn to much later on. I think you're probably getting a lot more information than you get uh, bet on. <laughs> I think I think about this a lot. This is what I do for work. You know, I'm uh, I am an ear surgeon. I do cochlear implants. I am a hearing scientist. I know how pe what people hear and what they don't hear. And then I'm a person with hearing loss, and I understand how all of this ties together. So this is where all of this is coming from.
I have one final question for you. What is your advice for other deaf and hard of hearing kids? I would tell them that it's not about hearing, it's about communication. And that communication is not just getting the information, but expressing it too. And to really teach a deaf kid to succeed, they need to have a lot of friends. They need to have a lot of social encounters. That way they will get over this communication bottleneck that deaf and hard of hearing uh, kids face. Not only that, it's not only is it just focusing on language, it gives repeated practice on how to advocate for yourself. I think it's very important that you do this, that parents, have, parents and kids have good mentors of people to look up to who pull them up and uh, look out for their success. Ah, uh, Haley. So let me get bounce that question you asked me uh, back to you. So what do you what would you say that parents of deaf and hard of hearing children need to do for their kids? Good question. I would say that deaf and hard of hearing kids can do anything they want to do and to support them in whatever they want to be in the future. And that's a wrap. And that's a wrap.